I couldn't be more pleased to be introducing a speaker so closely aligned with Gould's community and so much an exemplar of the values that we hold dear. Curiosity, courage, reverence for nature, and the will to make change for a better world. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Finian Donovan, class of 2000. Thank you, Sam, for the introduction, and thank you, Tao, for inviting me to speak today. Um, I just met Sam last week, but it's uh, exciting to me to, to see that someone with so much excitement and passion for this place is, is leading the Board of Trustees. I've known Tao for a lot longer. He was actually my first lacrosse coach when I was in middle school and played on the JV team here. Going back even further, uh, when I was in fourth grade, whatever age you are in that grade, I, I wasn't quite old enough to understand how ridiculous it was uh, to invite him to this, but every year at school there was uh, a grandparents day. My grandparents lived too far away to come and you know I was running around here as a, a faculty brat and my mom told me that I could invite someone else if I wanted to and Tao I think was probably in his 20s. <laughs> and I, I didn't realize how ridiculous it was to invite a guy in his 20s who I wasn't even related to to grandparents day. <laughs> but when I asked he showed up. So when he asked me to do this, while I was a little bit unsure, you know, why, he gave me his answer, but I'm here because he asked. So. All right, let's see what ChatGPT came up with for me to read to you guys. Uh, how, how many of you in the graduating class have birthdays in May or June? Okay, a few. So I don't believe this is planned, but the timing works out such that those of you who just raised your hands were born within days of when I was sitting in one of these chairs, uh, earning the same honors that all of you are today. It was exactly that many years ago. I remember a lot from my graduation. It was ridiculously hot out, about 100 degrees. That's not an exaggeration. I spent most of the ceremony wondering whose bright idea it was for me to have to dress from head to toe in a dark color and, and bake in the sun when it was that hot. We didn't have a tent back in my day. We were out in the elements, <laughs> suffering. I remember my classmates, their faces, their names, and plenty of stories that I could tell about each of them. I remember the faculty and how obviously bittersweet this whole thing was for them. I remember multiple conversations I had on this field after the graduation was complete, gifts that were given, and how thoughtful people were. If I'm being honest, I also remember wondering why everyone was making such a big deal out of graduation. Like, isn't this what you're supposed to do? It, it, wasn't this the plan all along? 18-year-old me had a tough time grasping the gravity of, of this event, and I'm guessing that some of you probably are, are having similar feelings. One thing that I don't remember is the guest speaker. I don't remember anything that they said. And I couldn't even tell you who it was. I do remember who the guest speaker was at my college graduation, sort of. He was one of the founders of the company Life is Good. Uh, and there are a couple of reasons why I remember him. The, when the faculty came marching out on the stage, they were all wearing these ridiculous hats. And this guy came walking out wearing a backwards baseball hat. And so he won me over right away. I initially assumed he was some young, rebellious professor because they hadn't introduced him yet. Turns out he was a successful entrepreneur who had been a politely rebellious young guy at one point with a dream of spreading optimism through t-shirt sales. I also remember him because every couple of minutes throughout his speech, he would reach down into the podium and pull out frisbee after frisbee and just throw them into the crowd. <laughs> and this, this guy could throw a frisbee really well. He was, he was sending some of them deep. He was calling out different majors, groups, organizations at the school and like nailing it. He was a sniper. <laughs> I still don't remember anything that he said though. So why am I letting you guys off the hook and telling you there's no pressure to remember anything that I say today? Because there just isn't. <laughs> when I think back to the major transition points in my life so far, it's clear to me that there's no secret to life. There's no one thing that anyone can tell you that will allow you to navigate with ease. And I think that's a good thing. If that existed, we'd all end up thinking the same way. We would all act the same way. There'd be no diversity of thought and we'd be robbed of the countless cultures that exist around the world. I think it's a very good thing that each of us has to figure it all out along the way.
Those major transitions in my life so far include graduating from here, attending the University of Vermont, confident that I was destined to be a doctor, facing the tough realization that I went to the wrong school for the wrong reasons, chose the wrong major for a different set of wrong reasons, <laughs> transferring to the University of New Hampshire and pursuing an art degree with firm plans of starting my own furniture company, graduating from college and instead commissioning in the Marine Corps in order to chase down adventure and maximize challenge in my life. Then leaving the military life behind to help tackle climate change on a global scale. The most recent major transition in my life was getting married, which is over there. Uh, my two older brothers and I spoke together at the Underclassmen Awards a few years ago. My younger brother was invited to speak as well, but couldn't make it, so we put a pretty embarrassing childhood picture of him up on the big screen, wearing nothing but tidy whities locked in with a pair of suspenders. <laughs> My basic message that day was that it took major decision after major decision of me knowing what the future held to realize that that just isn't how this works. You don't get to decide exactly how your life will play out. It took that for me to realize that anytime you start down a new path, there's no possible way of knowing exactly what that path has in store for you. So there's really no point in focusing on it. It's often more productive to just focus on why you were drawn to an opportunity in the first place. So that when you encounter the unexpected, you're still clear on what brought you there initially. I'm paraphrasing, and I apologize for recycling some of that material here, but I've only done so much in my life. I know that to you guys, 36 years old probably sounds like the age at which someone starts to ponder which hip to replace first. <laughs> but I promise that when you get here, you won't feel old and wise. Your list of unanswered questions won't be any shorter, it's just a different set of questions. Getting back to the, the transitions that I outlined, going from school to school to school, then job to job to job. Every one of those progressions was different, and every one of them felt entirely different to me. And I was a slightly different person each time. I expect that each of you will either find or define your own growth curve as you move forward, and the shape of it will be unique to you. My goal here today is really just to offer you something to think about, hoping that it can help you move forward with just a little more confidence. And if a few months from now you can't remember anything that I've said, I won't take it personally because that would be very, very hypocritical. <laughs> I had some fixed expectations when I first joined the Marine Corps. I thought I knew what it would be like because I'd read some books, watched some documentaries, I'd talked to some people who had done it. It was entirely different than what I was expecting, and I learned so much more than I had ever thought I would before starting down that path. I learned to read people because stress and pressure force people's true nature to the surface. I learned about myself, what my priorities are, my strengths and weaknesses, and how my brain really works. I learned about leadership and hardship. I learned how to tackle the seemingly impossible. When I was a team commander, my team chief, basically my, my number two, my right hand, as he used to refer to himself as, a guy named Jack, and he's to this day one of my best and most valued friends. He's older than me. At this point, he's 55. He grew up in the Azores Islands. He served in two different militaries, immigrated to a foreign country, fought in combat on multiple continents. He's raised three kids. This guy has dealt with some difficult situations. And he has a saying that I love for its simplicity. Whenever Jack sees someone who's struggling with anything, he always asks them, do you know the best way to get to the top of the highest mountain? You just keep putting one foot in front of the other. And I think that you guys will find that a lot of the times life really is just that simple. The biggest lesson the Marine Corps taught me is that it doesn't matter how difficult or even miserable things get as long as you're with the right people. I encountered that lesson over and over again in everything from physical exercise to tactical training scenarios and real world combat situations. When it really dawned on me, there were about 70 of us trying to earn a spot as a Marine Raider as part of the Marine Corps Special Operations Command. We are lying on our backs in the shallow water, cold, soaked, exhausted, from day after day of sleep deprivation. We were told we had to do 100 scissor kicks while one of the instructors counted out loud for us, and every single repetition was met by him with zero, zero, <laughs> zero, zero. So that by the time he actually started counting, we were doing several hundred. It was miserable, our bodies hurt, but I was laying there next to what are now some of my closest friends, and we were laughing because we were going through it with people who all made us, who all made each other feel like we could get through anything together. 
you don't have to do a few hundred scissor kicks after this to, to, to learn that. I, I think that you'll find it to be true regardless of where your pursuits take you. Difficulty fades when you surround yourself with the right people. The Marine Corps was an absolutely incredible experience for me. I miss it every single day. But I don't regret moving on because it was time for me to do something different. As Sam mentioned, Running Tide, which is where I work, where I work next and, and still work today, uh, was founded by another Gould graduate, Marty Alvin. I really had no appreciation for, or in some cases, even understanding of what the company was doing because I had so fully committed myself to my previous line of work that that was really all I knew, or so I thought. But I decided to head down that path anyways because the reasons I was drawn to it felt right. Running Tide is an ocean health company. We're focused specifically on how climate change impacts our oceans, as well as how we can leverage our oceans to fight back. Human consumption of fossil fuels and greenhouse gas emissions have aggressively disrupted an equilibrium that used to exist between the Earth's fast and slow carbon cycles. The fast carbon cycle can be thought of as what exists in the atmosphere and on the surface of the planet. Carbon lives in, in those places for short periods of time, like human lifetimes, hundreds of years. The slow carbon cycle can be thought of an, uh, existing in the Earth's geology and the deep ocean. Carbon lives in those places for long periods of time, thousands to millions of years. It moves naturally from cycle to cycle on its own, but most of it is supposed to be held in the slow cycle. We as a species have an absolutely enormous problem to solve in a terrifyingly short amount of time to do it. Global emissions are billions of tons more than the planet can sustain every single year. If that goes unchecked, we'll continue to see erratic weather patterns, natural disasters, species extinction, wildfires, drought, famine, and war, all at an ever accelerated rate. We can either reduce our emissions year over year around the world, or we can remove carbon that's already been displaced into the fast cycle and find a way to reintroduce it to the slow cycle. Those are our options. Realistically, we have to do both. I'm not trying to be a downer on a, a day that has brought so many people together for celebration. Where I'm going with this is that every problem presents an opportunity. And there's no shortage of opportunity if you're looking to put a dent in climate change. No part of it's going to be easy, though. And that's part of why I like it. I get asked often, what is it about Running Tide that I like the most? It's a company that merges maritime operations, international logistics, industrial scale fabrication and manufacturing, hardware engineering, software engineering, oceanography, data science, machine vision, biology, chemistry, aquaculture, business development, commercialization, goes on and on. The reason we're doing so many different things is because we have to. We have to because we're developing and implementing solutions in emerging industries that lack tailored support networks for outsourcing. Having one company perform across so many functional areas is absolutely incredible and incredibly frustrating all at the same time. It's difficult every day and it's never boring. So what's my favorite part of working at a company like that? It's the people. No company like this has ever existed before, which means that we don't have the luxury of going out and hiring people who have done this work before. Really, the only option that leaves us with is to bring together the right types of people. We have to bring together people of incredibly diverse backgrounds that are united by a mindset, a love of problem solving, and tenacity. That makes for an incredible team, and being surrounded by those types of people makes for an opportunity to find true reward in work. I've spoken a fair amount about challenge today. I believe that challenge is critical to growth. If you want to discover how far your potential can extend, then you need to continuously challenge your own estimates of what you're capable of. Challenge can either be met with vigor and enthusiasm or with reluctance and apprehension. The best way, in my opinion, to build fortitude is through failure. Not the catastrophic type that leaves you scarred, but failure that is metered and, and even planned sometimes. The school doesn't send students out to carry heavy packs up mountains and through the snow for eight days because they think it'll put a smile on your face the whole time. They send students out there with the expectation that it will force interpersonal conflict to a head, that it will give each student the opportunity to step beyond the previously understood boundaries of your abilities, and give each of you prolonged exposure to discomfort, both physical and mental. Each of those things offers a series of planned, metered failures, structured in a way that you can quickly be built back up. That doesn't happen alone, though. That's why you go out in groups. That's why, with the exception of a brief period of time, you go through that experience together so you can catch each other when someone stumbles and help one another back onto your feet so you can keep moving forward. 
whether it's junior four point, your orientation when you first arrived here, exams, games, weekend activities, relationships, Gould sets its students up to regularly dose in some failure because that's how you gain the confidence to meet challenge with vigor and enthusiasm. Whether it's the entire community that, that makes up this school, an athletic team, a dorm, or even just a roommate, Gould makes sure that you're surrounded by the right type of people. And those people are what I believe to be the other critical ingredient to stimulate personal growth. I've traveled all over the world, some for work, some for fun, some really nice places, some places that would chew you up and spit you out if you aren't paying attention. I've packed as much experience and adventure as I've been able to into three and a half decades, and if I've missed out on any, it hasn't been for lack of trying. I've had times that have left me overflowing with reward and fulfillment. I've had times that have left me wondering how things went so wrong. But through it all, what's become most clear to me is that no matter where you go or what you do, people are really all that matters. So be intentional in your relationships. Choose the people that you surround yourself with as you're transitioning into whatever you have planned next. I promise that if you focus on the people in your life, if you focus on what's best for the collective, you won't need to worry about what's best for you because someone else will. If you put the effort into truly caring about the people in your life, they'll look to you for leadership and support when things get difficult. When you're in a position of leadership, your number one job is to look out for the people who look up to you. And their number one job is to look out for the people they look up to. Most of the time, all you have to do is show up and be present. That's often all it takes for someone to understand how much you care. If every person in a team takes care of the people to the left and right of them, then nobody ever confronts, uh, <coughs> excuse me, confronts adversity on their own. You're all going to confront some amount of challenges you move forward from this place. For some of you, it will just happen naturally, while others will hunt it down. You don't have to deal with any of it alone, though. So stay in touch with one another and be intentional when deciding who else to surround yourself with during your next adventure. One last thing that I'll leave you with is that no matter how cool you become out there in the world, no matter how busy you get or how focused you become on something else, something else, you will never be too cool, too busy, or too focused to pick up the phone and call your parents. <laughs> your families have done more than you can easily recognize right now to help get you to this point, so be appreciative of that. Again, all you have to do is show up and be present, even if it's over the phone. So with that, I want to congratulate each and every one of you in this graduating class of 2023, as well as your families, on making it to this point, earning these honors, and tapping into the special type of preparation that Gould offers. Go do awesome things and have a ton of fun. Congrats, guys.